game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Hi, it's Raghu, and I'm back with Ram Das here and now, another episode. I just wanted to mention right off the bat, last night, Sharon Salzberg did a talk on behalf of our Ram Das Fellowship community. Y'all got to listen to this if you, or watch it if you haven't. Uh, it's, uh, and by the way, it is available. Just go to ramdas.org and slide over to the menu and see events and you'll see live streams and it'll be right there. Just scroll down and hit the start button. And it, it uh, here's what she said. I, this is the big takeaway for me. I, I can't believe she said it. Here's, she said, here's a new definition for mindfulness, which, of course, is the ubiquitous uh, word in spirituality over the last 10 years. And uh, here it is. Mindfulness is not punching someone in the face. That's mindfulness. <laughs> Uh, I guess I especially appreciate that, which means uh, there's a pause before you hit the send button, like, you know, emails or anything, you know, that instant reaction gets taken out. You don't punch someone right in the face. And and she told this great story of uh, uh, she was working, uh, I think, in Baltimore uh, with uh, inner city kids and teaching meditation and she taught meditation to this uh, one uh, child, I think, not child, but someone around 10, 11, 12 years old who, who had a lot of anger. And uh, so apparently this kid uh, went uh, up to another uh, one of her classmates and was angry and grabbed her by the throat and threw her up against the wall and said, you're just lucky I know how to meditate. <laughs> and then she went in the corner and started meditating. Oh, God, it's a great talk, everybody. Go check it out. Uh, also, while you're there, you can check out, we're doing this wonderful Ramdas Soul Land music series, having a bunch of different uh, artists uh, do a, uh, a live stream through Instagram. And uh, the first one was Trevor Hall the other night, was just uh, extraordinary because he's extraordinary, Trevor, and really combines spirit and uh, music in a way that's uh, so unique and his voice is so unique. Uh, so you can check that out too on that same page, which has a virtual retreat. You can replay it. And one last uh, prompt to you all is we are, uh, we had to, of course, cancel our Maui retreat, which was supposed to be in the spring. And then it was scheduled for the end of August. And of course, that can happen with what's going on with the pandemic. And so we're going to do a virtual retreat. It'll feature Krishna Das. We're going to have, uh, start the whole ball off with the, uh, uh, some uh, Ramdas Media. It's around. Uh, it's called Wise Hope, and it's around cultivating uh, loving resilience. And uh, alongside of Krishna Das will be Bob Thurman, who was going to be in Maui. Annie Lamott, who was also going to be in Maui. And then we've got Sharon coming back uh, for this retreat, the virtual retreat. Sharon Salzberg. Uh, we've got Valerie Carr, who you may have heard on my Mind Rolling podcast, uh, has a uh, See No Stranger, a wonderful uh, memoir slash manifesto. She's been doing racial justice stuff for a long, long time. Uh, she's going to be there. Uh, who else? My buddy Duncan and I are going to do something. Trevor Hall is going to be there and, and doing an evening with Krishnadas. Uh, 
Nina Rao is going to be there as well, doing Chalisa's. It is, um, it's just going to be quite a very full, profound retreat. So that's August 28th through 30th. Uh, make sure that you're on the Ramdas uh, email list and uh, or be here now network, and you will get a notice uh, with all the information. It is free. Of course, with everything we do, we can only do this with y'all's support. So whatever you can do, although we understand things are very tough these days, but uh, uh, we fortunately are getting uh, great support from you. So please do continue. And onward to Ramdas here and now talk. This is from Rhinebeck, so I'm assuming uh, in 1986, and I'm assuming it was at uh, Omega. And my good buddy and our resident librarian, curator, Nathan Wilburn, he, sends me, he sent this to me. Uh, he thought this would be a good thing to present, this talk, excerpt. And he says... It's a classic talk, all right? So meaning that this is, uh, Ram Dass is talking about the, the planes of consciousness channel analogy, which many of you guys that have been listening to the podcast have heard. And, uh, but he suggests that there are many, well, two things. One, that there are new listeners that um, really, uh, it would be very, uh, a very great thing if they if ever if they had some of the more common concepts uh, and that are around you know, that film becoming nobody uh, that we came out with last year, and then um, the um, this this allows folks to get into the older episodes as well, uh, and and he said, listen, regular listeners, sit tight while he sets the table because he gets into uh, unique perspectives that, you know, that's the great thing about Ram Dass, you know, all these uh, gazillions of talks that we have with him, each one is a little bit different how he presents it, and it's, uh, it just flips a switch that may not have been flipped before, right? Uh, so, spirit. And uh, he's, he, he, he's translating what that means, spirit, which infuses all form and also transcends all form. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff in here that Ram Dass talks about. There's no way that you can express spiritual experiences, many of them that we all have, it's ineffable. You can't talk about it. It's just, how do you explain? You know, that's why that which cannot be named, you know, that's why in various other spiritual traditions, especially um, in the Kabbalah, it's very, very much expressed as that which cannot be named. I have my own name for that, by the way. You might have heard it when I talk about it on Mind Rolling. Uh, which is that thing there, which is something that, that I learned in Quebec, where I'm from, in Montreal, because uh, largely French-speaking, and when one of my friends would try and explain something, but he didn't have enough English, he'd say, you know what, I mean that thing there. So that's kind of points to uh, what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, just the other day, I was uh, I was doing working on a film. We have this film that we're working on, K.C. Tuari, which was a being that Maharaji, Neem Karoli Baba, when he left, he said, you take care of the Westerners. And he was this uh, extraordinary being that was a mentor to us. He was a, he was a teacher in a private school who uh, dressed the way that, you know, in regular uh, suit jackets and slacks and tie and shirt and went to work but was actually a knocked out yogi of ex just, uh, uh, the, the film is called Brilliant Disguise because nobody knew who he was. And he, Maharaji, used to put him in samadhi all the time. And he, 
we would say, well, what, what was that like? He said, there is no way that I could come up with words to describe that. I don't even think he gave it that straight an answer. But uh, it's a good example of the way in which spiritual experience, we, we, we do a number of different things when we have. Now, I'm not talking about, of course, the samadhi that K.C. Tuari went into. He, he virtually, he, he would not have a pulse. I mean, it was that profound. He would not have breath. Uh, going, it's just some of the most classic, uh, you know, they, they call it nirvik, nir, nirvikalpa. I may have that wrong, but there's this different stages of this kind of absorption is my best word for it. Uh, but, you know, us littler guys that have do have experiences through meditation, through chanting, just being with somebody in, in that state, uh, that we we have a spiritual experience and and when it, it, it we do a few different kinds of things like we say well that's just that happened but it's not me it's really that's just for mystics not me or i was completely out of my mind or i was on a psychedelic or um we talk about it to everybody we meet and make it into a spiritually materialistic uh, deal. So, yeah, there's a lot. Ramdas really talks about how um, trying to reduce this stuff to words, and they aren't words. Uh, you know, th things that happen at the, and all of us know that at the gut level, that's where stuff really starts to change. And not not the intellectual, and uh, there's this one wonderful, wonderful uh, experience that Ramdas had. Uh, that's obviously very topical in that he took acid uh, with, uh, I believe, another therapist who was an African American, and he he talks about how he grew up being told not to be prejudiced about anybody with different color skin, religion, or any of that. And he said, but he got afraid because he thought he would get stuck in these uh, prejudices, which we are born into, which is a, a lot about, of course, what's going on today and what happened. Uh, the, the wound got opened up by the murder of George Floyd. And so in this trip, he went to a plane where he got beyond individual differences and saw the depth at which we are all one in a way that was gut level, not intellectual. And uh, so when you, he said, when you, uh, when you see behind individual differences in, in yourself, I don't know if he said that or I'm thinking that. Of course, everything I think about these days, even though he's gone, I run through his mind. I mean, we used to spend so much time on a day-to-day -day basis talking about this stuff. You know, I'd be doing these, taking his excerpts and doing these introductions and t telling him what I was saying and through my own lens. And we used to have the greatest time and he fooled with me so much. It was so fun. Anyhow, yeah, see behind the, I think you have to see behind the individual cell differences in yourself. But then you can cut that judging mind, you know. You, you end up with a, a real, de and this is what happened in, in, with this acid uh, trip with Ram Dass. He ended up with this being, he ended up with a deep sense of appreciation of the uniqueness, the individual differences and the uni uniqueness that we all ha have beyond race, beyond color. Uh, and uh, it's it's like you can it, sort of the moral of the story is you can live in your separateness without attachment to your separateness. Right? So it's not like um, you know 
it's about, com- and this is his big thing that he used to say over the years, it's about becoming free, not becoming high. So another great, great talk from Ram Dass. Um, and as uh, Nathan said, it's got some really, all of the groundwork in terms of what different planes of consciousness uh, that uh, we live on uh, that Ram Dass has talked about uh, for many, many years, the, the channel analogy. And uh, it's, it's, I think, and if you've heard it before, it'll be good to listen to it again and again and, and again and again and again <laughs> till we get it. Oh, boy. So this is uh, Ram Dass, Here and Now, and uh, it's called How Different It Is. That's kind of cool. Raghu Marcus here. I'll be back next time. Uh, you can go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and check out all the wonderful podcasts that we have going. Um, we've got a new podcaster who is going to be coming aboard in the next week or two, Conda Mason. And Conda is part of Spirit Rock and has been doing wonderful work around social justice for many years. It's just a fabulous person. You heard her on my Mind Rolling. Uh, we've had her on a couple of times. Mind Rolling podcast. Uh, Nikki Walton, just the most lovely, wonderful beam of light uh, that has a podcast with us. So please do join us and we'll see you next time. What do I mean by spirit? It's not, uh, I'm not talking about religion. Religions are methods for coming into the spirit. What I am referring to by spirit is that which infuses all forms, but which transcends all forms. You and I have learned about who we are, and it's been so well learned that we are personality, we are body, we are social role. And that learning is so thick for us all that there isn't space very often to hear who else we are because we have gotten so um, attached to the information that we get from our senses and that we can think about, that when we try to conceive of some part of ourselves that isn't knowable through your sense and can't be thought about, we are at a loss often. And we give up and we just say, those things are nice for the mystics, but they have nothing to do with me. And when we go out of our minds into these realms that are called transcendent realms, very often we treat them as, we immediately either define them as irrelevant, saying I was out of my mind, or I lost it. Or we tend to immediately try to grab it and collect it and say, wow, I just had an incredibly high experience, and we convert it into spiritual materialism, and add, as I've written about, another moldering butterfly to our collection. Well, if you know what happened to me last Tuesday? And for me, the hell was, after years of trying to describe my spiritual experiences to other people, that all I had left was the words I had used to describe them because the, I had reduced them to the words, and they aren't words. The words and the concepts are just like fingers pointing at the moon. They're not the moon. They're just the finger pointing at the moon. So when you start to approach the issue of spirit, you're faced immediately with this bizarre paradox that what you can think about it and talk about it isn't what it is. And yet it is. I mean, let's go right to the edge right away. We won't start in so easy. It's as if there is an iceberg in which there's just the top showing above the water. And the top is the only part of ourselves that we know we know about through our minds and our senses. 
and all the rest of it is submerged. And as William James said, philosopher said, you can spend your entire life without even knowing of its existence, this place below the water, but apply the requisite stimulus, and there it all is suddenly, in all its completeness, it was there all the time. And it's absolutely familiar to you. Absolutely, you are at one with it. It's who you are in question, unquestionably, undeniably. It's very familiar. It feels like home. When you transcend that separateness that the mind keeps casting you into, you experience a feeling of being at one with things. You have a sense of an intuitive rightness. You feel a natural and spontaneous compassion. You understand what it means to be in love, not in love with, but in love. And then a moment later, the way we say it in the East, karma reasserts itself. And you are back into your senses and your thinking mind. And who you are, one moment later, is who you think you are. The metaphor that many of you be who know my tapes better than I know my tapes. Some of you come up and recite me to myself as we walk down the lanes here, and I get kind of nauseous at the thought of... <laughs> So all I have to do is say number 76 and you'll all laugh, see, because I don't even have to tell the stories anymore. So I will make one disclaimer at the beginning and not another one for the next five days. Oldies are goodies, which you've all heard me say, too. And I've heard the stories many times and I keep learning from them. So you might as well get in the habit of hearing the same stories over again. It makes it easier for some of you to whom this stuff is a little far out that I'm saying. Some of you are already say, oh, I know all that. Let's go on. Some of you do and you don't. Some of you say, what the hell is he talking about? What am I doing at a retreat like this? So and I want to bring everybody along. So let me just run through the like planes of consciousness so you'll be comfortable with it. If you look around, you listen to birds, airplanes, you look around, you see people, you see flowers and grass. That is all what's called the physical plane. We'll call it the physical plane. I don't know whether it's called, we'll call it the physical plane. On the physical plane, as you look up here, you see a 55-year-old, balding, handsome gentleman. Okay. Now, uh, sexual arousal, which um, has a significant role in the culture, as you may have noticed, since it's what keeps the species going, can function solely on that level in the sense that your endocrine system is set up in such a way that there are certain what are called in instinct theory key releasing stimuli. There are certain things out there that turn you on even before you get into your psychological fantasies which is a whole later level but in the same way that a cow a bull is turned on by a cow that is in heat or elephants, or fish, or everyone. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. And at that level, it doesn't really take a hell of a lot of psychological fantasy. The bull doesn't have to fantasize about the cow. The smell does it. And on that level, you can look around at other human beings and they all fall into one of three categories, either a potential, a competitor, or irrelevant. <laughs> and you and I walk through different environments where we are at one moment a potential, at another moment a competitor, and another moment irrelevant. 
For a long time, when I was doing early spiritual work, I wanted to protect myself from the incredible sexual feast that the West provided. So by wearing a beard and a dress simultaneously, <laughs> I found myself in the role of irrelevant <laughs> to all but a very few. <laughs> And we mustn't forget that we are, in part, animals. And these animals have endocrine systems, and these endocrine systems are designed to work in certain ways. And the, at that level, there is protection, survival of the separate entity, and reproduction are very clearly built into the system at that level. If you flip to channel two, you enter into the domain that most of us live in most of the time, which is the domain of, of psychosocial reality. It's the domain where you don't need, you desire. Needs the first channel, desire is the second one. It's the plane at which your desires define the universe in which you live. If I am psychologically feeling lonely, my desire is to find companionship and I look at everybody as a potential companion or not. It may have nothing to do with sexuality anymore or survival. If I am feeling very inadequate and very impotent, I may become preoccupied with power. And then I look at everybody in terms of do I have more or less power than they do. If I feel dependent, I look for somebody who is nurturing. If I am very nurturing, I look for somebody who's dependent. There are always earth mothers who just have to be nurturing all the time. They would nurture a rock. They can't stop. They just have to keep nurturing. It's just built into the system. And they are really miserable when they have nothing to nurture because they are totally identified with that particular psychological aspect of themselves. And it's partly psychological and partly physiological, and that's why it's a confusion. It's channels one and two, really, at those levels. But anywhere up until the first six months is where the process is laid down of channel two. First six months of life, during that time, you begin to sense that when you pinch the bedpost and you pinch your foot, it feels different. And you begin to define a sense of boundaries or parameters or self versus other or some kind of separateness. And then you start to learn from your socialization agents, which are more familiarly known as parents. You begin to know... I mean, I didn't, I'm not going to waste all my Ph.D. training in psychology for, uh, for nothing. I'm going to use it if I can. So you are an ambulatory variable, a set of ambulatory variables being taught by a set of socializing agents. That's what we used to write for National Institute of Mental Health grants about children. At any rate, you learn who you are and who you aren't. And you develop, I developed a sense of who Richard was, who Richie was who Rich was and who Dick was. These were all different people, by the way. When my parents were firm with me, I was Richard. When I had done something very sweet, I was Rich. And I learned what I should do to be good and what I should do to be bad, and I developed a psychological definition of myself called a self-concept. It's a set of conceptual structures of the mind that define who you are and who everybody else is and how you relate to them. Are you less powerful than they are? Are you more powerful? Are you needful or are you not needful? Are you playful with them or you had you better watch out? This is all psychological stuff. And as I look around, you can see everybody's personality is almost written on their sleeve by the way they dress, by the way they care for their body, by the way their facial muscles show. Everybody is showing who they think they are. And this is all channel two. Who do you think you are? Well, I think I'm quite responsible and thoughtful. That's that look. 
<laughs> hey, man. That's that look. Hey. Hey. I mean, you can tell just these littlest clues, which who everybody thinks they are all the time. And as people walk down the street, they're just like the Doctor Strange comics with these huge mind nets coming out of their heads saying, this is who I think I am. This is who I think I am. And little old ladies, this is who I think I am. This is who I think I am. And everybody enters into a conspiracy of I'll make believe you are who you think you are if you will make believe I am who I think I am. And let's not screw around. And if you go up to somebody and say, come on, you're not a little old lady, they will take offense. But I am, you know, my grandchildren are, let me show you my pictures. I'll show you my credentials to being a little old lady. All of the psychological and social roles are all part of this package of Channel 2. Mother, lawyer, doctor, teacher, social worker, student, seeker, spiritual seeker. It's all Psych Channel 2. These are all definitions we have of ourselves. These are all our mind, our intellect, our conceptual structure. Notice how dramatic the individual differences are on channels 1 and 2. On channel 1, you look at people, they're big, small, fat, thin, dark, light, bald, hirsute, whatever. On channel two, we've got incredible numbers of instruments to say, to discuss individual differences. The Rorschach, the Minnesota multiphasic inventory, the California personality, on and on and on and on. How are you different from me? What's, how do we peg each other? The judging mind is part of channel two, because one of the ways we peg is better or worse, lesser or greater. Flip to channel three. There's only 12 of us here. You are a Sagittarius. I just know. Don't ask me how I know. I just know. <laughs> you know people like that? <laughs> I bet you're a Taurus. It's an individual difference based on a planetary configuration at the time of conception and the time of birth. There are different systems. And it explains another realm or level of individual differences, how you're different from me and how she's different from her and from him. It's also the level that Jung plays with. That's the level of archetypes or mythic identities. So that because of your planetary configuration, your deeper raison debt of life is that I am always going to be in search of truth. That's a nice one. Who are you? I'm in search of truth. See, that's who I am. I'm in search of truth. I always, that's the one I rip off all the time. And when you have these mythic identities, when your psychological self is in harmony with that mythic role, you feel right on. You feel that's really who you are at the deepest level. So it's astrology and mythic definition. It's the bigger than life kind of sense of oneself. Channel three. Channel four. In channel four, if I look at you, I look into your eyes. What I see when I look into your eyes is another being, being now, another being just like me, looking back at me. That's why in Christianity it's called, the eyes are called the windows of the soul. Because I see another soul in there, another being, whether you call it soul or that's too heavy for you, just call it another awareness. Another being, another being different from me, but just like me, looking back at me, and the only difference between you and me is that you're packaged differently than I am in channels one, two, and three. And at that moment, you see channels one, two, and three all as packaging, in the same way as I'm wearing a gray sweater. 
and you see body, personality, and you look at somebody and you see them in a different body, in a different personality, in a different mythic dimension, but you see it's another being just like you and you say, hey, are you in there? Far out, I'm in here. How did you get into that one? And you realize that that person is walking around the universe with a different set of individual differences around them in so tight that they've identified with these things. They think they're their gray sweater, and therefore they are creating a universe. They're experiencing a universe around them that is completely the projection out of all these individual differences. In other words, instead of seeing the gray sweater as environment, they see it as self. Is this too confusing, or are you with me thus far? Anybody upset yet? Okay. At this plane, when this plane is real, who are we sitting out here on the lawn in New York State? That's channel one. Who are we, a group of seekers and students trying to get our acts together? Channel two. Who are we as eternal seekers after truth? Channel three. Who are we as souls? We are beings who have taken birth into these unique packages, and we are meeting as a gathering of souls to recognize one another behind the packaging because the packaging is taking away our freedom. The identification with the packaging is what we all got caught in when we took birth, and the whole meaning of the term awakening is awakening out of identification with the packaging so that you can acknowledge that part of you which lies behind the package, because the soul is nothing you can sense with your eyes, ears, nose, mouth, or skin, or you can actually think about, because the soul is not an object, and thinking mind always thinks about things. And the problem with the soul is it's like the flashlight beam. It can't flash on itself. And the soul is what looks. It isn't what is looked upon. And all the rest of it, channels one, two, and three, is all what's looked upon. It's all what you can think about. It's all what you can sense as object. In other words, soul is the first level you're getting into the breakdown of the dualism between subject and object. So at the level of channel four, you and I are separate, but not different. Now, where's the judgment left? I can judge your package. I can say, gee, that's a funny sweater you're wearing or a shirt. But I don't judge you anymore. You're just like me. What am I going to judge you about? You're just a soul on a different trip. And the reason you've got that unique packaging is because of, and I'll just leap levels, because of your karma, your karma, your predicament. It's the stuff you brought in with you. Because of who you were, what stuff your soul was carrying as you took birth, you created a set of packagings into which you would get lost in order to go through a set, a curriculum called life, in which you would have a series of experiences that you'd think were real. Until you got to the point where you awakened and you said, oh my God, I got taken again. <laughs> and you will see that indeed it wasn't, another, it wasn't all real, it's only relatively real. I had this interesting experience. Um, I grew up with a Jewish middle-class mother and a father. But my mother was a very uh, strong and effective woman who thought of herself as a member of the tribe who was going to raise good children in her model of middle-class Jewish tradition. I am the product of that. She taught me well. I was loved and cuffed appropriately fed simus and brownies till I was couldn't walk, and in general used a lot of emotional, conditional love and food love to train me properly. And so I knew her as the agent of reinforcement. <laughs> I knew her as mum, as mother, as ma. And I rebelled against her. I didn't talk to her once for six months. 
I went into analysis over her. I had transference and all kinds of stuff about her. It took years to just allow her to exist. After what she did to me. <laughs> okay, now, that's the first scenario. That's the scenario some of you may be familiar with. I assume it's rare, but some of you may recognize it. All right. Now, I went to India, and I met Maharaji. And Maharaji blew my mind and opened my heart. And I'm not going to tell you about that, because you can read about it. In fact, if you didn't, I don't know what you're doing here. But the second day, it was an interesting day when I was with Maharaji. He called me up, and he said to me, through a translator, he said, your mother is a very high being. And I said to the translator, <laughs> I said, didn't he say was because she died six months before? And he asked Maharaji, Maharaji said, nay, she is a very high being. Now, high in India means old. It means an entity that has gone through many cycles. And as he did that, something funny happened inside me. I remembered, an image came to mind. I remembered a moment when my mother and I were in a car. We had just come from taking me to the dentist. I must have been maybe 11. And we were playing a game to see who could hold a note the longest. We were going, ah! And we stopped at a red light. The windows were closed. And we were both going, ah! And we both simultaneously turned, and there was a man in the car next to us looking at us as if we were both mad. Right? And at that moment, we both went out together. And there was no mother and there was no child. There was just this moment of, ah, where suddenly we were meeting as two fellow beings who had just been caught with our defenses down, so to speak. Now, I thought later that I could, in the hands of almost one hand, count the number of times that she and I had transcended our role relationship, where she had come out from being the good middle-class Jewish mother, and I had come out from being the deferential or rebellious son, to where we had just met as fellow beings. Are you there? I'm here. Far out that we're meeting this way this time. Who were you last time? We're mother and son this time. Isn't that far out? I, we, we never said that to each other, by the way. But when he said that, your mother is a high being, I suddenly saw this old being taking birth, were doing her work that she had to do as that middle-class person raising her children, and that I had gotten, I needed her, and I got entrapped in her web just as she got entrapped in my web. And only moments did we wake up out of the illusion together and recognize one another. But from the moment he said that on, those four or five incidents at which we came out of it became real or became figure. And all the ways in which we were middle class parent and son became ground or background. It just flipped just like that, and it never changed again. It's the same thing that happened to me when I, for, when I took, um, was taking psilocybin back in the early 60s. We had a psychiatrist that was part of uh, our research team. His name was Madison Presnell, and he was black. And I had grown up in a Jewish ghetto, middle-class ghetto, really, upper-middle-class ghetto. And I had been taught that you do not have prejudice against people of other colors, creeds, races, etc., religions. So in my intellect, I had no prejudice. But emotionally, I was frightened. And I felt separateness. But I covered it over with my intellect, as all liberals do. I don't mean to be pushing you, I just want to 
share what I felt. I don't say anybody else. This is, can be my psychosis. So Madison and I took psychedelics together. We took psilocybin, which is the mushroom, Tiananocto, the flesh of the gods. And I was looking at Madison, and I went through plane after plane after plane, and suddenly there he was, another being just like me. He was just wearing a different color skin than I was. And I experienced it directly, and it was real. From that moment on, I don't remember having any conscious feelings of having to override anything in me that was prejudicial towards anybody else in terms of color of skin or things like that. It just disappeared. Experientially, I had met another plane where all that was irrelevant, and suddenly there was a figure ground reversal. That story, by the way, is important because it points out the kind of gut level at which things really change for people, not the level where you intellectually think you should change them, which is a different level. We can all act a certain way, but it's a different thing when the gut thing happens. And when you connect with that part of you which is behind your individual differences, you then can look at another person and appreciate that part of them that's behind their individual differences. And until you recognize that in yourself, you can't see it in another person, except intellectually. As long as you are identified with your individual differences, you are constantly judging everybody else as to whether or not they are better or worse than you. The judging mind just runs rampant. The minute you identify with that part of you which is not different from anybody else, then when you look at differences, you end up with a deep sense of appreciation, appreciating the uniqueness of everybody you meet. Instead of I am better or worse, because as long as you're in your individual differences, you are wondering, are my differences better than anybody else's differences? Are they as good as? The minute you recognize yourself as the same as everybody else, not better and not worse, nothing special, just another being, then you look at everybody else as unique in their packaging, unique in their work in life, and you appreciate them just as you look at that tree and you look at that tree and you don't say, that tree should be that tree, which we do with humans all the time. We say, why aren't you like Mother Teresa? You think you're doing good? Why don't you be like Mother Teresa? Why aren't you like Gandhi? Why aren't you like Will Rogers? Well, I really, when I grow up, I want to be like, you know, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had his work to do, Gandhi had his work to do, Mother Teresa has her work to do, and you have your work to do. And it's no better or worse. From a, from a soul's point of view, it's just a different set of experiences. You have a separate curriculum. And you don't want to live anybody else's curriculum because you can't anyway, so only the desire to do it is just part of your curriculum. <laughs> So then, just like trees, when you say, oh boy, what a beautiful, it's a pine, and an elm, and an oak, maple, and you just appreciate individual differences, so you do with humans as well. You just appreciate individual differences. Let me tell you how far that goes. When you're sitting with somebody that's dying, that's just the soul going through its curriculum at that moment. And the fact that you're not dying is no better or worse. It's just a different curriculum. So that you begin to quiet down from the point where you were lost in your separateness and lost in your individual differences you get to quiet down a little bit and start to cultivate this quality of appreciation. Now, I just said the word lost in separateness. You've got to realize that you are still separate as a soul. And so I've got to take you to channel five. Because in channel five, when I look into your eyes, it's as if I am looking at myself, looking at myself, looking at myself, because there's only one of it. Just imagine now 
that the entire universe is consciousness. It's all consciousness. Those trees are consciousness. These flowers are consciousness. This paper is consciousness. This foot is consciousness. This, you could call it energy. You could call it quanta of energy. Or you could call it consciousness. Or you could call it love. Or you could call it, you can call it anything you want, because what you call it isn't what it is. But imagine, just for, to play with, imagine it's all consciousness. The whole universe is consciousness. And then that consciousness gets sort of, what you have that it doesn't have is you have self-consciousness. The tree isn't sitting around saying, well, I'm a tree. At least you don't think it is. The soul that's in the tree may say, I am a soul that's incarnated as a tree, by the way. And there are, each tree has its own spirit. I asked Emmanuel, what are rocks experience? And he said, ecstasy. That was very refreshing. I like that. When you climb out the level beyond soul, there's only one of us. And now imagine this one thing that keeps coming through. It keeps manifesting in these myriad different ways, all of which take themselves seriously as real. It's like this finger says, well, I'm real and I'm not you. See? Well, you guys are both part of the hand. Well, the hell we are. We are two separate fingers. I'm the index finger and I'm the one that's important. I point. Well, I'm the one that picks your nose and you better not, you better be gone or me or you're going to be in trouble. Pardon my crudity, but got to keep the whole crowd here. <laughs> each finger has its part to play and each one gets thinking it's the finger it's the real one and the fact that it's connected to the hand is lost in the shuffle it doesn't see below below the knuckle and then you cut through and you recognize we are all part of a thing it's like a huge schmoo and we're all part of it, and we just keep going out into these various forms and these little pseudopods of forms, and then this little consciousness starts to become self-aware in its separateness because it eats of the apple in the Garden of Eden and knows itself, and then it gets lost in its separateness, and then only much later, 10 billion incarnations later, does it say, oh boy, did I get lost? and then it awakens, and then it returns, and then it becomes part of the one that it never left in the first place. It only thought it left it. Because where could you go? There's only one of it. Where are you going to go? Are you going to leave it? I'm leaving all of you. So you realize now that something like loneliness, where is that? Loneliness happens to be a channel to trap got stuck in channel two. Oh, I'm lonely. What are you lonely about? You're part, you're sitting in the ocean saying I'm thirsty. Not only that, but your body is 99% water. What are you being thirsty about? No, I'm thirsty because you're identified with the one part that isn't water. And just to complete the picture, we have to change to channel six where as I turn to that channel, the channel disappears, you disappear, I disappear, all of it disappears, the whole concept, everything disappears. And that keeps the Buddhists happy. And that actually is channel five, just looked at from the other side. Because when you're in the middle of one, you're not busy saying, we're one. Because you say one from the point of view of two. The minute you are in one, there's no nothing, so it's zero. So one and zero are the same, depending on where you're looking at it from. Okay, now, the game of getting free spiritually is not ending up being a soul without a body. The game isn't to end up out in la-la land, although we thought it was for the first 10 years I took drugs. I thought the game was to get high because being in a body and in a personality was such a drag. There was so much suffering. It was like being in a prison cell. 
It's that kind of claustrophobic feeling of, oh my God, I'm me and I can't get out of it. And you go to the shrink and you go to the masseuse and you go to the, you take drugs and you, you leap out and then you fall back. You leap out and you'll fall back. I remember once taking acid and going to watch Nureyev dance. I watched him twice. And I watched him first from the orchestra. And I saw this beautiful being of form. I just saw form. I didn't see humanness anymore. I just saw perfect forms as he leaped. But the next time, I unfortunately sat in the dress circle because I was in a fancy group for the opening of Lincoln Center. And I looked down and I saw this whole, I was again on acid in those days, and I saw this whole species of animal that kept trying to fly but couldn't. And it kept leaping up and falling back to earth and leaping up and falling back to earth and leaping up and falling back. And it was so poignant. I was, tears were rolling down my cheeks at the, at the pain of the predicament of these poor slobs that kept, they just weren't ready to fly yet. Another 10,000 incarnations and they could do it. And at that point, my model was that the game was to get high, meaning to get rid of the planes of my body and my personality because they were so scrunchy and so imprisoned. What confused me at that time is why I was in an incarnation. Because if the game was to get free and it was all fine, why did I get stuck in the first place? That's the question people ask. And was my being stuck in an incarnation an error? Had somebody made a monstrous mistake? And was I paying the price for it? Now, the predicament was that as I kept going into other planes of consciousness where I would stand outside of time and space or on the edge of time and space and look at time and space and everything contained within it, all I could see was law and form. I saw absolutely breathtaking lawful relationships among everything. Not man law, but law. Law like the Tao. Law like the way of things. Things had a harmony and its name was the Tao, the way of things. Everything was in a harmonious relationship to everything else. I could feel that. I could see it. I could actually see it. I could see it in little puddles where the ocean had come up and left little fish and shells. I could see it in the stars. I could see it in psychology, I could, more or less. I could see it in art and music. I could see it in mathematics. I could see it in astrology, in astronomy, astrology. Everywhere I looked, I could see law. I could see that my body was decaying in a lawful pattern, fashion. I could see as I studied cognitive psychology that my thinking mind responded to lawful things, that why I thought what I thought was lawful. It wasn't coming out of nothing. In fact, that all form everywhere I looked in the universe, including thought with form, was all within law. It was all lawfully related to everything else. And therefore, my taking incarnation and my being in this form was all part of that law. And how would I understand that law to understand what I was doing here? The statement, truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. If you are attached to desire, you see only the outward containers, is the expression. Truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. Channel one has longing. Channel two has longing. Channel three has longing. At least until I get to channel four and channel five. Only then. In fact, channel five, where I have no work to do because I'm already there, because I was nowhere to go and I'm already here and I've always been here. Only in this channel will I see how it is. In other words, I'll see how God works when I'm God. That's true. Only God knows what God's, God's work. Everybody else is just presuming. They're looking through these narrow little slits saying, this must be God's work. It's like the blind men touching the elephant.
I can't tell you what fun this is for me to go this slowly. I hope I'm not boring you all. I'll tell you, I just came from a lecture I had to give in Aspen, Colorado, where I was given 45 minutes to say all this plus everything I'm going to say for the rest of the week. I end up talking about... And it all, you leave it all half-baked. And the fun of developing it all and feeling your way back through it all so it's all real is just such fun for me. I just uh, don't want... I, I'll have to watch carefully to see if it gets too tedious. So getting high meant, in the old days, for me, getting out at least into Channel 3, which was, wow, oh, yeah, you know who we are, wow, man. Dig this trip. I mean, the trip of Mother Earth and saving the Earth, and we are on our white horses, and we're doing good, and we are, it was the cosmic, oh boy, and you'd leap across planets, and you were vast and great and Tolkien-like. And everything was mythically significant. And most people wanted to stop there. Because that's like super sensual city, too. It's delicious. Everything's bigger than life. Sex is cosmic. I mean, it's all, ah, ooh, wow. If by any chance you should stop for a second and go through into the next channel, it's a little much more. You should go into channel four, because then suddenly you are nothing special. You're just another part of the whole system. You're beyond your cosmic role. You're just like that tree or that rock or that stone. You're just another one of it. Nothing special. I gave a whole series of lectures called Nothing New by Nobody Special. But it was phony because I was busy being nobody special. That was just another specialty. And then if you go through into the one, you disappear as a separate entity. And then you are merely part of it all. You're no longer separate. And then you are truly home. And that's what I thought getting high was. Once you have tasted of those planes, no matter how you try while you are in this incarnation to stay in those, you cannot stay in them. Because if you are a rock, you honor your rockness. If you are a tree, you honor your treeness. And if you are a human, you honor your humanness. And the quality of humanness within this structure that I'm presenting is to honor your humanness fully, you can stand nowhere. Meaning you don't stand in your body, you, but you don't deny it. You don't stand in your personality, but you don't deny it. You don't stand in your astrology or your cosmology, but you don't deny it. You don't stand in your soul, but you don't deny it. You don't stand in God, but you don't deny it. Or nothingness, but you don't deny it. They are all equally real. They are all who you are. And yet, in terms of the iceberg, the top part that mo almost 99% of the world thinks is what's real is only channel one and two, and channel three, four, five, and six are all underneath the water. But once you recognize channels three, four, five, and six, it changes the meaning of the experiences of channel one and two from then on. Once you've awakened, they say you can't go back to sleep. You may go back for moments, but you'll awaken again. People say, oh, I was on the spiritual path and then I lost it. Don't be silly, you can't lose it. No, I lost it, I lost it. The fact you even think there's something to lose means you haven't lost it. Let's go ahead and lose it some more. We'll wait. No rush. It turns out that the game is to become free, not high. And free means you don't stand anywhere. And in order to not stand anywhere, you have to cultivate as because you took birth and you got lost into your separateness, you have to cultivate that experience and that going beyond experience into that part of you where you are not separate and then you have to live in your separateness and yet not attached to your separateness. It's what Christ talks about as living in the world, but not of the world. But you don't not live in the world. How different it is to live in the world when you are a conscious soul going through an, a curriculum than when you are a personality we pushing yourself through the 
the thick stuff that your mind keeps creating, how different it is. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.